Well, as a Baptist preacher, there are certain expectations that are automatically placed on me. No matter who I am as a Baptist preacher, I have expectations. One of those expectations is that I am to preach about sin, right? I mean, a Baptist preacher who doesn't preach about sin, well, that's not a Baptist preacher then. And for the most part, I'm against sin. Right, dear, I'm against it, right? Yes, my wife is saying I'm against sin. So I'm going to preach against sin. Now, we have sermon after sermon after sermon on that. Then there's another expectation. After I preach enough about sin, then I preach about what? I preach about do good, right? What did the preacher say? He told us to do good. All right, that's awesome. And you know, whenever I preach sermons that I call a do-good sermon, we could feel, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm doing well. And I can get a good nap in. Well, this morning, I'm going to suggest that you fall asleep really quickly because the do-good sermon that I have for you today is not easy to do, all right? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, we're going to finish up this chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, we'll be in the chapter 6, but right now, we're going to be looking at loving your enemies, right? This is whenever the sermons start to meddle into your business just a bit because we all can love our neighbors. We can even love acquaintances, but when we have to love our enemies... That is another issue entirely. So, Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Let's stand at the reading of God's Word, as is our custom here at Second Baptist Church. Verse 38 says, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt... Hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You may be seated. So let me just share with you how we're going to walk through the service, all right, the sermon here. We're going to have three points and a conclusion, all right? I know, a Baptist preacher with three points in his sermon, all right? We're going to begin with love your enemies. Don't retaliate. We're going to look at verses 38 through 42 about that. Then we're going to move on to love your enemies. Even pray for them, verses 43 through 47. And then we get to the really difficult one, love your enemies, be like God in verse 48. And then we're going to come back to just the main point, love your enemies. So let's go at the beginning. Love your enemies, don't retaliate. How are we as Christians supposed to live? How are we supposed to be living in God's kingdom? We're supposed to be living in his kingdom first, right? Which means we have an elected God. That means that God is king. Jesus is what? He is Lord of lords. He's king of kings. That means he is in charge. And so we live an ethic that comes from above. We live an ethic and a morality that comes from God himself. So our passage that we've been looking at for the last really month has been telling us about how to live, and now we see how to live with those that, well, they, they oppose us. They hurt us. They don't have our best in their will. How do we act justly? Folks, to, to live with justice, we've got to have laws, Right? I mean, sin's in the world, and so we've got to learn how to get along with one another. And in the Old Testament, laws were given, and the laws were an improvement to the laws of the ancient Near East and what they were doing. There was a law about revenge. How do I respond to those who have hurt me? And in the cultures of the ancient Near East, if somebody hurt you, then you could come back and hurt them more, even hurt them and their family members And if somebody took a family member's life, you could respond by taking several of their family members' lives. Well, that's not very equal, is it? But that's the way the culture was. So when Jesus is talking about the law of Moses saying eye for eye, tooth for tooth, he is saying that there needs to be some equivalency 
there needs to be some evenness there in the justice and in the discipline and in the punishment. And the other cultures around the ancient Near East from the Israel, they would favor those who were rich. They would favor those who had position. Oh, the law is different for you. But the law of Moses said what? The law of Moses said, no, when you come before God, you are all equal. And so the law of Moses in the Old Testament is a vast improvement in the laws of the ancient Near East. And so when Jesus comes along, he's not saying that the law of retribution was bad. He's saying, you know what, there is an ethic that we can live that will fulfill that law and even give a greater intent about what that law meant. So how do we do that? Jesus teaches us that ethic from above that whenever we're insulted, we respond with grace. Whenever we're insulted, we respond with grace. Now, think about hitting me on my right cheek. Just think about it. Don't come up and do it, please, okay? Yeah, just think about it. So if you hit me on the right cheek, how are you going to be hitting me? All right? I'm right-handed, and if I hit you, I'm going to be hitting your left cheek, right? I've got to make sure my left from my right here. This is my right cheek. So if you want to hit this, it's... You're not going to all of a sudden use your left hand. You're going to use a backhand, right? And so it's more of an insult. But Jesus, I think, also was trying to stress a little hyperbole here because he doesn't say whenever you're insulted. He says whenever you're struck on the right cheek. And so there's an emphasis there. There's a little bit more there that he wants us to do. And so, yes, when I'm struck on the right cheek, when I'm insulted, when I'm hurt, I turn the other cheek. Now, is it because I'm weak? Well, it it could be because, yes, I am physically weak, okay? But no, it's not because I'm weak. It's because the strength that God has given to me that I don't have to retaliate in kind. I don't have to retaliate the same way. I don't have to come down on your level to be able to get my point across. Folks, that takes strength. That takes divine power to do that because inside of our hearts, we have lied to ourselves and our society lies to us that if we take insults and hurts, that we are going to somehow be destroyed if we don't fight back, and that's a lie from the enemy. Now, I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about pacifism here. I've I've shared with you before. I would love to be a pacifist. There's just some Bible verses that I can't quite interpret that way. And I don't begrudge anybody who is a pacifist. I admire that. The early church seems to be filled with pacifists. But at the same time, our society is bombarding us with what? With action movies. What are action movies? Isn't there going to be some revenge in there somewhere, right? Right? Don't we celebrate that? Yeah, they got them good, didn't they? Yeah, they really did. Jesus doesn't say, get them good. Yeah, that's what the kingdom's about. No, the kingdom was about what? The kingdom was about doing good, which is what? Loving our enemies. And so we're not going to reach out toward our enemies with strikes and with blows. We're going to be giants for the Lord and stand for him and our grace. When taken to court... We're going to respond with grace. Jesus is using, again, he uses a little bit of hyperbole. If somebody somebody sues you for your shirt, he says, give to them also your outer coat so that now you're you're exposed. (laughs) Literally, right? Literally, which was a shame in that society at that time. Now, Jesus isn't saying, I want you to literally strip down anytime somebody comes to sue you and give them everything that you own. Oh, that's, that's not what he's saying. Again, it's hyperbole. But what we say, folks, is that our possessions don't possess us. And so that if I lose everything, all of my possessions, I haven't lost myself because I am possessed by Jesus. I am his. He owns me. And I am to serve him faithfully in all that I do. So possessions, he's the one that holds on to us when pressed by the government. Have you been pressed by the government? Hmm? 
Maybe with an inoculation, maybe was that just, it wasn't that long ago, right? Oh, I'm going to get to meddling, right? I'm not going on either side of this, all right? That's not the point for the day. But our love for our government, which, by the way, we must love our government so much because none of us are making a beeline to go move somewhere else, you know? I, I want to live in Paraguay, all right? Yeah, that's what I want to do. First, I have to learn where it is. It's in South America somewhere, right? Folks, in the ancient times, in Israel, in Jesus' day, the government was from Rome. In Rome, they just wanted to make sure you did what they said. And so they do that, they made sure that their soldiers were spread out throughout the empire. And the Roman soldier had a right to come to somebody. If you're working outside your house, the Roman soldier had the authority to come and tell you, you have to help me carry my things, all right? You have to come and work with me. You have to go a mile. That's what the law said. I'm sure they weren't legalistic about that, though. You know, this morning, a, a lady came into the church building real early, and she was carrying a lot of stuff. And so, how's the gentleman? I opened the door for her. How about that? You know what I did? I even offered to carry some of that stuff for her. How about that? Wasn't that great of me? You know why I could do that? It's because I knew the furthest point she was going to go in the church was a Sunday school class upstairs, and that was it. Now, if she'd have said, sure, here, carry this for a mile for me, I'd have been doing what? Oh, wait a minute. I, I didn't sign up for that now. I mean, I wanted to help you. I didn't want to help you, okay? What's Jesus telling us to do? He's saying you've got to go the extra, right? You've got to do what is extra, not just what's a little inconvenient, the extra. And we have to do it, folks, hear this. We have to do it with the right attitude. Because if we do the right thing with the wrong attitude, then you destroy the right thing, right? That per there's no brownie points for that. Now, if I had my choice, you know, between you doing it with the wrong attitude or not doing it at all, do it with the wrong attitude and we'll work on the attitude, all right? We'll get that fixed. But it comes both and. I need to do it. I need to do it as if I'm serving the Lord and not the person necessarily that's irritating me nonstop. Grace means whatever I do, I'm going to reflect Jesus Christ so that just somehow maybe I'll have an opportunity to tell this person about Jesus Christ, about what he did, how he lived the perfect life, how he died on the cross, and the one who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. And so that as he died on the cross and placed in that tomb, death didn't have a hold on him because he'd never sinned, so he rose from the grave. And that's why his crucifixion is different, right? And for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that person will be saved. Folks, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's not about my convenience. It's not about getting what I want. It's about me sharing the love of Jesus and about living this life the way God has called me to live it. So yes, when we're pressed by the government, we're going to react with grace. What about when someone asks for help? I need some help. We don't ignore them, right? We also don't enable them in their bad behavior if that's why they're needing help. But we respond with grace. We respond with grace because we care. And the reason we care is what? It's not only because Christ taught us to, it's because we recognize every person that we see is somebody made in the image of God, just like you and I are. And so that those who are in need, yes, they're made in the image of God, and I'm going to treat the image of God the way he should be treated in this life. So Jesus then, folks, this is an act of grace. This isn't passive, all right? It may look passive to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. They think they may have won some great victory over you. I mean, if somebody defeats you, I mean, remember, I'm not real strong. Defeat me, whoo, yeah, you haven't won much, okay? But you can't defeat me because Christ is in me, and he's going to win the victory over you. So it's an act of grace. It's not passive resistance. If you just resist passively, you're going to break. And so we're going to treat, we're going to act with grace. So that, yes, what does that mean? That means that, you know, I, I talked to you about buttons before, you know, press, getting people to press your buttons. Don't let them press your buttons. And you know, you should know what kind of presses your buttons. And when you're having one of those really blessed days that just nothing seems to be going right, everything is irritating you, and you really just want to explode, Right? All right, so 
my, my suggestion to you isn't that you go out and drive around Corpus Christi, okay? I'll drive in this city and I'll just relax, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. Sometimes we have to drive though. And if you have to drive, especially on SPID, you need to be prayed up. You need to pray for grace. You need to pre-pray for grace. Is that, yeah, that pre-pray for grace. That's it, yes. Pre-pray for that grace so that you're not going to blow your top and that you're going to explode. No, that's what this means. That's one way what Jesus is talking to us about. So that whenever you have to talk to your internet provider, <laughs> I suggest this one here very much. You pray before you begin to dial the number, okay? Knowing what? Knowing that you're going to have to give grace for about a half an hour to a machine as you punch the different numbers getting through all of the menus, right? Then you can be gracious to a person maybe if you've punched the numbers right. means that whenever we go to the bank real quick... <laughs> I, we didn't know they had so many comedians around here. I'm just going to stop by the bank real quick and then be over. No, 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 no. I mean, you've been teased enough with the quick visit to the bank, right, that it's a possibility. But then what? There's a long line, and it's a slow line, right? I don't, so just know whatever line you get in, it's the slowest because it works for me at the store. I don't know why. I still look. I look for the shortest line. Silly me. It's the shortest line. It's going to be the most time in that line. And I know, don't look around, Dana, don't look around because I'm going to look around and I'm going to see, hey, that guy got in line after me in that line over there. And sure enough, he's going to be out the door before I'm even unloading my cart, right? Right. What do we do in all of this? We pre-pray for grace. God, I'm going to need the grace to get through these difficult times here. I need that grace from you. As Grant Osborne says, he puts it this way here, folks about what we know to be true is that we, quote, kingdom citizens expect little from this world and place their trust wholly in God. That's what we do. What are your expectations of the world? The world that's against God. Don't expect much because we belong to him and we live in his kingdom. All right, love your enemies. Love your enemies, even pray for them. Love, love your enemies. This is the, this is the tough part, right, isn't it? Those who are going to come out against you. We've heard it said, Jesus says, love your neighbor. That's Old Testament teaching. Evidently, they've added to the teaching, you can hate your enemies. Oh, you know what? You know what Psalm 109.6 says? Ah, I saw one. You know, you know when you read the Bible, it's like, oh, I've never seen that before. That's an awesome verse, all right? That's what I did with that verse. It says in that verse, the psalmist is writing, he says, Lord, appoint an evil person to oppose my enemy. Oh, isn't that great? That's kind of like hiring a spiritual hitman, right? <laughs> Lord, get somebody really evil to go after that person. All right, yeah. Oh, not me, it wasn't me. No, no, no. Okay, that's not what the psalm's about, okay? Even though the verse says that. What the verse is teaching us is that you can come to God and say, Lord, I am upset. But on this side of the cross, we don't get to pray against our enemies. We get to love our enemies. That's one of the differences of the cross. Remember, the cross didn't just bring salvation. It changed many things in this world. And one of the things that changed is that we love our enemies. We don't oppose them. We don't hate them. We don't pray against them. So, yes, if we just loved our neighbors, folks, well, most people can do that. I know one or two of you may have a crazy neighbor or something, but for the most part, we can love our neighbors. We can be kind to those who are kind to us. We can love those who are like us. Even those who don't follow Jesus have a good time doing that. We love those who are difficult to love, and so that's how we live. We're to turn our enemies into friends. That's the best way to do it. That's the best way to love an enemy. Lead them to Christ, and then they're a brother, then they're a sister. And isn't that what Jesus did? He was always accused because he was always doing this. He was always, he was always eating with tax collectors and other sinners, wasn't he? He was seeking to turn people who were alienated and enemies of God and bring them into the kingdom so that they would now be friends of God. So we pray for our enemies. We love them. We don't pray against them. And then that last verse, verse 48, love your enemies, be like God, perfect, be perfect. Oh, my goodness. Wow. 
How can we do that? In, in some ways, scholars will point out that word perfect doesn't always mean perfect, even though it is the word that is used in the Old Testament to describe sacrifices that were without blemish. Be perfect as the Lord your God is perfect. Be perfect. I mean, perfect means no mess ups at all. That, that's tough. Some scholars say that word means mature, all right? And it does. It does mean that, and that's part of it. It means whole or wholehearted, and it means that too. But the key word, I think, in our phrase, folks, isn't perfect because there it is. That's a, that's a tall one. The key word is as. It's a comparison. Who do you compare yourself to? Well, I can compare myself to my neighbors, right? Folks who live around me. Guess who is more perfect than his neighbors? <laughs> Me, I am. I am better than my neighbors, okay? I can, I can even give you some reasons why. You know, hey, I do this. I don't do that, right? They'll do that, though, sometimes. We all have that problem of comparing ourselves with other people. And when we do that, we're going to come out looking pretty good. But when we compare ourselves to God, we can throw up our hands and say it's impossible and quit following Jesus. Or we can look to God and say, you know what, Lord? There's the goal. It is lofty. It is a stretch. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to stretch. I'm going to do that. I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep trying to be more holy. I want to keep trying to be more perfect. That's what my goal is. And so that's how we then live our lives in Christ. Love your enemies, folks. We come to the end. Do good. Love your enemies, right? If there's anything that I want you to take, that's what I want you to take. Preacher preached about doing good. Yeah, love, you love your enemies. Yeah, I don't like that part, but I'll have to do it. Quote from Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. He says, we know what is really happening seeing it from the point of view of eternity. And we know that we will be taken care of no matter what. We can be vulnerable because we are, in the end, simply invulnerable, end quote. You can't destroy me because I'm indestructible in Christ. Jesus will teach later, don't fear the one who can take away your body and kill you. Fear the one that can send your soul into hell. Fear God. That's who you fear. And when Jesus is my friend, I'm now invulnerable because I am owned by him. Enemies. Romans 5 verse 10, Paul writes and says that in our sin, we were enemies of God. But back in verse 8, he reminded us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love for us, isn't it? Although we were enemies of God, he says, you know what? I'm going to send my divine son, Jesus. He's going to die for you to give you a chance at salvation. Folks, that's what we say this morning. We're going to give you an opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. How can you love your enemies? How can you be perfect like God. If you don't know Christ, you can't, all right? That's just a fact. You can't do it. It'll be a faint comparison at best. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you see that, yes, I can love my enemies because I see reality. I see all of history, past and future, and I understand my destiny that I am invulnerable and that I can seek God to be more like him. In a moment, I'm going to have you stand. I want to pray with you. The staff will be up here at the front for those of you that would like to come forward and pray. Some of you need to give your life to Jesus. Today needs to be the day of your salvation. And folks, if anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved is what Romans 10 says. Let this be the day of your salvation. Perhaps you've been called to join this church. Come forward. We'll talk to you about joining the church. Perhaps to surrender to special service. We want to know about that and pray over you. And what's your decision right now as God speaks to us, each one of you, about loving your enemy. Let's stand for our word of prayer.
Lord God, to do good, that sounds easy. But when you get specific in Scripture about what that means, it becomes difficult. And our passage before us today seems to be most difficult. To love our enemies, to be perfect like you. Lord, it's as we surrender our lives to you that even improvement is possible. Lord, challenge us in order to sharpen us to be conformed with your image, to love enemies as you did. And Lord, for those that need to make decisions, especially those that need to make a decision for your salvation, bring them forward. Force them to come this day, right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.